Over the last 40 years, I've developed and led fuels and combustion equipment safety programs for the largest manufacturers in the world. Today, I'm bringing you knowledge, insights, and best practices about fired equipment and natural gas safety. Over the next few minutes, you'll get the kind of practical, real-life explanations that I've become known for. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing award-winning engineer John Pushkar in the final episode of a three-part series. We've been diving into how engineers help to protect the public and the role they play during and after tragic disasters like the recent Florida condominium collapse. John, what's on your mind today for this wrap-up episode? Layla, I truly appreciate the chance to have had this three-part series with you to explore some of the behind the scenes of engineering disasters. I want to remind the audience where we came from and where we're headed. So we started talking about the Florida condo collapse and how it is that engineers investigate things and are often called upon to deliver bad news. In our second episode, we talked about engineers' participation at disaster scenes, what that's like from an emotional perspective, from a physical perspective, and then also discussed how it is that these large legal cases get supported. And today, we're going to close with talking about what happens after fires and explosions in large industrial organizations, oftentimes large public corporations, how the pieces get picked up, and in some cases, how cultures get changed, especially where CEOs and the board of directors really have a very solid commitment to getting this done. Because as you'll see as we move forward in this episode, it really takes a solid commitment. John, there must come a time when the legal cases are over, the site gets cleaned up, and organizations want to recover and move on. Can you tell us what happens then? Layla, no one in any organization, regardless the size or the stature, likes it when some disaster happens. It means that customers lose confidence in the organization and its product. It means that shareholders lose confidence in whether or not the company is being properly managed. And it means that employees also lose confidence in whether or not they're protected, whether or not they're going to come home safely every day at work. I've been in the boardrooms and C-suites of public corporations where CEOs have looked me in the eye and said, look, this can never happen again. You need to help us. We don't really care what it takes. It's not a money thing. I've had a CEO look me in the face and say, do you realize this is like the third incident that I've had under my watch? If something like this happens again, I'm gone. They're literally going to think I'm an idiot. So today, I want to move on talking about how actually these things get changed and what needs to happen inside an organization to not only make a change, but to make it long-term sustainable. And making it long-term sustainable is all about changing the culture. So it's a cultural problem. When I think of culture, I think of customs and things people are used to and have seen throughout the generations. How does one go about fixing that? Yes, you got it exactly. It's years of having the abnormal look like it's normal. It's a little bit of a, a creeping in philosophy where something's ignored, something's deemed to be okay when it's really not where people are lazy, where rules aren't enforced. Next thing you know, these near miss types of incidents are happening on a more frequent basis until just the flat out unthinkable occurs one day. Then everybody wonders, well, just how did we get here? Gee, is it one particular area we should be focusing on? When the more you peel the layers of the onion, you see that it's been a systematic failure of culture. I learned from years of implementing programs to change cultures related to fuels and combustion system safety within large organizations that sometimes have hundreds of facilities around the world, that it's really a systemic, sustainable change. It's a cultural phenomenon that you've got to really strive for. And that takes a lot of effort. I've developed a process for this. It's a somewhat proprietary process and I describe it in my book. It's there for everyone to read. 
But reading it and implementing it and implementing it properly are kind of two different things. In my book, I talk about my PPE acronym, and that's not the kind of PPE that we've learned about in the COVID experience. No, it's people, policies, and equipment. And those are the kinds of things that really need to change on an enterprise-wide level to make cultural changes sustainable over long periods of time. That sounds kind of like a simple solution for a very complex set of circumstances. Is it really not very complicated to fix these kinds of situations? You're exactly right. The concept PPE sounds very simple. And sometimes it takes a lot of effort to boil down a very complex set of things into something that's relatively simple sounding. That's what I've done here. But simple and easy are two different things. First of all, it takes a management team that's very committed and very committed to a long-term, somewhat painful change. When I say somewhat long-term and painful, it means that there's parts of this that are going to be expensive, time-consuming. There's going to have to be a needs assessment done in several areas. There's going to need to be training programs that focus on not only knowledge, but on skills and an entire redo of how training is done, how procedures are written, how procedures are implemented. The policy part especially gets to be a very serious endeavor. It means creating subject matter experts within organizations. It means holding people accountable for things. It means having policies about when preventive maintenance is done and keeping to those schedules. The equipment part of this means a gap analysis, and that's quite an endeavor. That's a part that many CEOs find to be somewhat distasteful because it means, frankly, documenting where your shortcomings are and creating long-term plans that in some cases are quite expensive to implement from a direct today's dollar spent perspective. However, if folks can look at the long term, they see that it's a wonderful investment. I got most of that and it all makes sense, but I'm not sure I understand that gap analysis part. What do you mean by that? So you see, Layla, codes and standards change on cycles and it's typically about every three years. They say codes and standards, the changes in them, they're written in blood and it's often quite true. When we come together at meetings to discuss changes to codes and standards, usually it's because some horrible tragedy has happened and we're looking to make sure that those things aren't repeated. So although most codes and standards are required to be followed when something is first installed, there's no legal need to continue to follow how codes and standards change through the life of a piece of equipment and make sure that you're compliant. The terrible downside of this is that you could have installed something 50 years ago with the safety devices that were known to make sense at that time and have never changed them and still be considered code compliant. Are you best practice compliant? No. Has what you've done made sense? Absolutely not. It doesn't make sense from a business risk perspective or from the perspective of protecting your people. It really makes sense to at least be aware of what changes are in codes and standards as time moves on. A perfect example is that NFPA 86, a standard for ovens and furnaces, it used to require only one solenoid shutoff valve on pilot systems. It was learned through a number of explosions that having two in series dramatically reduces risks. It's a couple of hundred dollar change in most cases. Most people, when they hear about this, say, wow, that really makes sense, I'd be happy to comply. There are then others who have no awareness of changes in codes and standards. They never upgrade their equipment and they're living there daily with risks that don't make sense and that frankly, if they had it explained to them, they would happily move on and make some of these changes. But conducting a gap analysis requires a ton of effort. It's quite a commitment to go audit every piece of equipment that you have, 
to audit the safety devices on those pieces of equipment, the maintenance that's been performed, the actual components that are now installed, to audit procedures that you have or don't have, and to audit the training that's been done of staff that operate and maintain all of this equipment. This kind of an effort typically documents hundreds of deficiencies where you don't comply with what's in force today. That makes sense. I can see that some corporations would feel exposed having documents that actually say their level of safety is way behind the times. Well, now you know why I said you have to be courageous and committed. There are many who are somewhat squeamish about having documented deficiencies. Just saying that phrase, documenting deficiencies, puts a frown on the face of many attorneys and corporate legal counsel. But at the end of the day, in my discussions with plaintiff's attorneys, my discussions with OSHA professionals and Department of Labor attorneys, it seems clear to me that you're much better off recognizing that you have issues, having a plan to correct those issues, and actually be working your plan, rather than hide, pretend like you have no issues, and suffer those consequences. And the best of my clients through the years are the ones who have recognized that and worked very hard to make their employees, and I mean every employee, part of the effort. I'll tell you a little story about a couple of contrasting types of clients that I've had through the years. One particular client, and I won't even mention the industries because it'll kind of give it away, but they were in parallel industries, manufacturing the same generic product. In one case, we would go through their facilities, conduct gap analyses. Once in a while, you'd find a very serious problem. And I remember being in one particular plant, and this was a cultural thing, and, and tapping someone on the shoulder who was in, on the management team and saying, hey, Bob, we found this and this at this particular uh, boiler. And Bob would whisper to me, who knows about this? Have you told anybody? Did any of the hourly people see this? Have you mentioned this to anyone? Contrasted with another client, again in the same industry, found something on their equipment, tapped someone on the shoulder. And right away the gentleman said, stop what you're doing, get the rest of your team, I want to get my team, I want to get the union health and safety people involved, and I want everybody to know. We have nothing to hide, we're all a team here. Which of these two organizations do you believe has been the most successful? I think you know the answer. It sounds like a successful gap analysis for a number of plants could identify millions of dollars of possible fixes and maybe hundreds of issues to address. That seems a bit overwhelming. Layla, as you can imagine, none of these things get to the scale of huge tragedies in an instant. These things take years to develop. Like I said in the beginning, it's years of bad habits being nurtured. So you can expect that fixing these things also takes many years. This can be a three to five year program and a very focused three to five years of effort. The idea is to make it sustainable. The idea is to move myself and my team out, create subject matter experts and a management team, and in some cases, the appointment of new personnel who didn't exist before. I know everyone hates headcount, but sometimes that's what this takes to avoid having terrible disasters that do things like tank the company's stock and take away customer confidence. That makes sense. I guess if you don't think this through and have it become a system, it's probably forgotten quickly. Yep, and now again, we're back to that culture part. It takes years for people to understand the new rules, recognize the new rules, and to make them second nature. In fact, one of the iconic figures of the process safety industry was a gentleman from over in England named Trevor Kletz. Trevor's kind of the godfather of process safety management. And in one of his books about learning from industrial disasters, Trevor identified the fact, and this is based on his research, that these 
horrible, huge tragedies repeat themselves in the same organizations about every 10 years. And why does it happen? Because people get complacent. People start thinking, gee, uh, why, do, why are we doing that extra step that costs us money every time we perform that startup on that piece of equipment? Let's cut that out. We can probably save an hour, get a little bit more production. They sometimes have this short corporate memory. And if you don't work hard enough on making this all sustainable, you'll be in this repeat cycle. And that's what I try to work very hard to break. Is it difficult for large organizations to make sense of this from a financial point of view? Overall, it seems like quite a commitment. Only the somewhat short-sighted organizations don't see this. Unfortunately, there are quite a number of those, as you might imagine. They again forget about what this means in a public corporation when analysts see disaster after disaster. They don't see how stockholders think about being part of an, an organization like this where you know, you've got all of the economic risks and factors and now you've got this management team that can't seem to keep plants from having big fires or explosions. You have employees who don't feel safe. It means that labor organizations are much more aggressive at protecting their people as they should be. So again, there's a number of unfortunate things that happen here when these things get repeated and people don't learn these lessons. Over the long term, my PPE process is a much better economic investment than continuing to do nothing or taking some short-sighted approach to fix what the immediate problem appears to be. John, if there happens to be some C-suite executive watching this and wanting to get a hold of you, how would this happen? Layla, my personal cell number is 216-213-6201. I work lots of crazy hours, as I know that many C-suite executives do, but I'm always there for a consult, always happy to explain some of the concepts in my book. And once again, Layla, thank you very much for allowing me to bring all of these very important behind-the-scenes issues out into the open about how engineers are part of preventing disasters, delivering bad news, being part of the legal process, and how at the end of the day, we try to change the cultures to make these things hopefully never happen again. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Hi, it's John Pushkar. I hope you found this episode useful. If you'd like to know about more ways that I can help, you can check out my website at www.prescientts.com. There you'll find information about the Prescient Technical Services Online School, my book, Fuels and Combustion System Safety, What You Don't Know Can Kill You, and also about some of the consulting projects that I've been providing to clients for the past 40 years. Things like implementing inspection and testing programs on a corporate enterprise-wide level, things like reviewing and commenting on capital equipment purchases that involve combustion equipment, and even being a legal expert if things go really wrong. Once again, thank you for attending, and remember, be safe out there. The life you save, it just might be yours.